Good evening, everyone. It's great to see a packed house. I mean, I'm not surprised because what we're talking about tonight <clears throat> is one of the kind of biggest opportunities in the region in a couple of generations, probably. Um, my name's Tim Forsett. I'm the Birmingham city lead at Mont MacDonald. Uh, so I focus on the whole of the West Midlands, not just Birmingham, and how to bring cross-sector approaches, approaches to solving social, economic and environmental challenges. Uh, and I also have the privilege of chairing the Infrastructure Leadership Board at Centre for the New Midlands, which I'll talk more about a bit later. Uh, first of all, a quick safety moment. Uh, there's no planned fire drills or evacuations. If the fire alarm sounds, please follow the spoken instructions. Don't use the lifts, although we're on the ground floor, so I think we're OK. Uh, proceed out of the building in an orderly manner. Do not take belongings. The fire assembly point is university lock student accommodation. Follow the fire marshals to the side exit. So for those of you who might be new to Centre of the Midlands, the first time you might have heard about them is <coughs> this event. Uh, it is the only non-partisan, independent, not-for-profit think tank in the West Midlands region. Uh, and we, and I say we, it's especially Chris who founded as the MD of the think tank, uh, are dedicated to the cre creation and sharing of new ideas and research to help shape an even better West Midlands. So Chris founded it in 2020 and it's gone from strength to strength. Uh, the centre's interests are focused on housing community, digital, people and skills, and this event is the formal launch of the infrastructure work stream. Uh, so our, our work is to help shape an even better West Midlands through evidence-based policy, making and delivery. And a final thing for me on the Centre for New Midlands is to encourage you, if you're not already, to join the Reimagining the Region Network. Uh, it's now over 60 organisations with Virgin Money, DRD MG Limited, Waitman's LLP and Devcoms is the latest organisation to join it. <clears throat> and if it, go, it goes without saying, if, if you're not currently a member, speak to Chris afterwards and he'll give you all the details. <laughs> uh, there is a small annual fee <laughs> to join, but um, from my perspective, it's really, really good value. Uh, it gives access to a network of people whose only real common denominator is they want the West Midlands to be an even better place to live, work and play. Um, and it also gives access to high-profile speakers and events like the Mayor Andrew Street tonight. Um, I also I suspect for many of you, it's the first time you've been to Steamhouse. It's my first time here, despite having heard about it and talked to the people at Steamhouse for, for maybe 18 months now. Uh, and at the end of today, colleagues from Steamhouse, um, you can meet them in reception and they can give you a tour of the facilities here, and I really recommend it. Um, it's an amazing facility and an amazing organisation. So we at Mott McDonald have, have uh, been increasingly working with Steamhouse over the past couple of years on our own staff development, but also project work like Coventry, very like rail, because they bring a real different approach to innovation, especially in STEM and STEAM. So I mentioned the Infrastructure Leadership Board at Centre for the New Midlands. Uh, the the workstream started last summer when we had a conference called Connections for Prosperity over two days at Warwick Conferences. And we had speakers like Andy Street and, and Richard Parker, who's Labour's mayoral candidate for the West Midlands. Uh, Julie Nugent, the Chief Executive of Conference City Council. Sir John Armit, who's the Chair of the National Infrastructure Commission. Ed Cox, who's the Exec Director of Strategy, Integration and Net Zero at the Combined Authority. And Professor Denise Bauer, who is a Group Director of Mott MacDonald. So I've got to mention her, right? Um, and we use that as a springboard to launch the Infrastructure Leadership Board. Like the other work streams at the centre, it's guided by professionals from across the region and all of the, uh, the board are here tonight. We've had a, a session this afternoon working out what our approach and priorities are going to be for this year. Uh, and they come from public and private sector, academia, and across engineering, construction, architecture, planning, surveying, finance, and more. And I really want to acknowledge their contribution. So they are Deb Bunce, who's head of sustainable construction at UCB. Craig Flindle, who's the COO at Warwickshire County Cricket Club. Andrew Jinks, who's the regional director for National Highways. Tolu Oshakita, uh, who's a strategic advisor for infrastructure investment, energy transition and transport. Sandeep Shingardia, who's the director of strategic partnerships and integration at Transport for West Midlands. Harbinder Singh Birdie, who's the creative director at Birdie and Partners. And Rainy Dezoiza, who's a senior BD manager at Balfour BT. <coughs> Thank you all. So if there's any, anything you think as a region we need to be exploring in the infrastructure space, please speak to, speak to me or any one of those other board members who are here and we'll listen and see what we can do. So tonight's focusing on transport, which obviously is one of the most kind of obvious sectors in, in infrastructure, but we collectively as a board want to consider all types of infrastructure, so that's transport, energy, communications, water and wastewater. 
but also recognising that economic infrastructure, like those things, exist as part of a system of systems, and we need to consider social infrastructure, like healthcare and education, and natural systems, because they're all intrinsically linked. We also need to recognise that infrastructure is interdependent with the other focus uh, areas at the, the centre of the New Midlands. Those are housing, communities, skills and digital. And we really want to explore those intersections as well. And recognise that decarbonisation and climate resilience are the key challenges of our time. And that rapid change is needed, but in a socially just way. So that's, you know, as far as I see it, that's the biggest challenge of our, of our time. So what better piece of infrastructure, though, to focus on uh, as the launch event for the Workstream as Midland Rail Hub? It's the biggest infrastructure project in the region after HS2, uh, and this year is a critical year for the project. Funding has been confirmed from government um, in network, the Network North paper, and this year also sees the project turn from strategic planning to consenting and on towards delivery. So we, we're going to hear more about what the Middles Rail Hub is from, from our panel um, and what it will mean for rail capacity in the region, but, but so what? What does more rail capacity really mean? What are the wider benefits and how, <coughs> how do we identify and consciously maximise those benefits? So that's what we as a panel are going to be discussing after Andy uh, Street comes up to talk to us about it. But first, uh, the, tonight wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, uh, the Midlands Rail Alliance, and I'd like to introduce Alastair MacDonald to come and talk about it. And it would help if I turn it on. <laughs> so good afternoon uh, and welcome to Birmingham. Uh, as, uh, as that uh, ever younger looking picture uh, suggests, uh, I am actually Alistair MacDonald. It doesn't look like it, but uh, yes, that is me. Um, civil engineers, more than almost any other profession, shape the foundations of our society. Uh, when you turn on the light, when you cross the road, even when you drop your kids off at school, uh, we deliver that infrastructure uh, that supports all of those activities. However, I uh, have an admission to make. Uh, occasionally, and it is very occasionally, uh, in the complexity of shaping those foundations, we don't always keep our focus on the reasons we're building that infrastructure. Reasons like uh, better connecting families, reducing the environmental impact of our transport systems, um, improving access to meaningful work. The Midlands Rail Alliance is a partnership between the region's largest and most able uh, civil engineering organisations. And we are determined to keep the focus on those reasons. As a result... I'm delighted to be able to support the Centre for the New, for, for the New Midlands in hosting today's event. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to discuss why the Midlands Rail Hub is so important to local communities and to maximise the benefits we bring to the region by focusing on the reasons we build infrastructure. So let me finish by saying thank you to the speakers for leading the discussion and to you for joining us today. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy the event. Thanks very much, Alistair. And actually, all I'm going to do now is introduce uh, Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands. He's going to come and talk to us about uh, Midlands Rail Hub and whatever else you want to talk about, Andy. Uh, we're aware <laughs> there's a big day for you coming up. Um, <laughs> uh, and then Andy and I will have a conversation around Midland Rail Hub, uh, and then we'll go on to the panel discussion. So, Andy, over to you. First of all, and Asa, thank you very much for supporting this event. And Tim, thank you for your introduction. Hope there's not too much feedback on that. But there is a little, perhaps someone can turn that down, sort it out. OK, so um, all you ever wanted to know about Midland Rail Hub. What it's not, let me be clear about this first of all, it's not an alternative to HS2. Some people have said it was the sort of consolation prize for HS2. So let's just deal with that sort of lie before we go any further. It sits alongside HS2. I will explain how in a little. It always was designed to sit alongside HS2 and probably uh, the best 
piece of evidence that is the case for this was being pressed well before the government decided its Manchester decision on HS2 North. And I will just give you a bit of the gory detail of that uh, in a moment. So it's a separate uh, case, but aligned to HS2. It is uh, just a, mo a day to reflect a little bit about sort of not HS2, because the reason I was a few minutes late and sorry to kick the event off uh, a little late was that I'd actually been with Andy Burnham over in Paradise, and I can run from Paradise to here in my work shoes in 10 minutes, it would appear. Um, uh, uh, with Ben. He was fitter than me running here, I have to say, but he's got a few years on me. Uh, but the reason we were doing that was today we were dealing with the media, updating on the private sector work on the alternative to HS2 north of Birmingham. And the great story is that the private sector has come together since the decision in Manchester to say there is a different way of doing this. And I'm actually extremely confident that what we will put to government will convince them that there still has to be an answer to the connectivity question between Birmingham and Manchester, irrespective of what they've decided about HS2. But I think just the way to think about this is HS2 is a national level problem. It's about connecting London and the Midlands and the North. Uh, Midland Rail Hub is about connectivity within the region. It's not micro-local. This isn't just about you know, what goes on in the WMCA area. This is the sort of next, dare I use the jargon word, spatial level, how we connect the whole of the Midlands. It is not trying to connect London to Birmingham to Manchester, so it sits alongside. And it's actually an incredibly successful story of the Midlands coming together to make our case. And I suspect there's lots of people in the room who've been part of the uh, Midland Rail Hub lobbying, and I do just want to call out um, Midlands Connect, as you said, the Midland Rail and our, uh, Alliance, and actually Network Rail, because it was about two years ago that we decided to really get a grip of this project. And I will admit that it's very clever people in Network Rail who had all their sort of train path diagrams that I didn't really understand that actually took it from something conceptually to something where there was a really good business case. So the story of the business case is that it was about, as I say, two years ago, where lots of work had been done, but um, uh, Peter Hendy, who is the outstanding chair of uh, Network Rail, said to me, OK, Andy, we really are going to try to get this over the line. This really matters. And by the way, at the time, he and I thought that HS2 was safe, and hence why we thought we'd then turn our attention to this. We did lots of detailed work with Network Rail, as I say. But then we started to try to influence a new incoming Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, and I think it was about 10 days after he was appointed that we were in his office with all of our drawings, lobbying him, really getting him to uh, at least support the work. And you never know, uh, get to the point where it would be fully funded. And of course, the good news is that the government did say, uh, once they got to Network North, the, as I say, the uh, consolation prize for the cancelling of HS2 North, that they would quote unquote fully fund at Midland Rail Hub. Now, we will never know the truth, whether they would have fully funded it anyway, uh, irrespective of the HS2 decision, but it is true to say that the cash was not there when the Prime Minister made his decision to cancel, and then miraculously, it was there. Whether it would have happened anyway, as I say, we will never know, but it is true that the cash is there in the Network North document, and it very clearly says £1.75 billion for Midland Rail Hub. And we are expecting the Secretary of State for Transport, Mark Harper, to be here a little later this month to confirm the decision, as they call it, the decision to get to the detailed design of it now using that funding. So there will be a big public day with the government minister to say we're getting on with it. So that's the sort of story of how we've got to this point. And as I say, it's a success story around lobbying and come together. I need to explain what it's all about. What's the jargon all about? Now, the really big idea behind it is about releasing pressure on New Street Station. Because as everybody knows, when New Street gums up, and if you want to see the complexity of it, a few weeks ago, I had a rather anoraki visit to the control centre, the signalling centre down in Salt Lake, and you see all the diagrams and the poor chaps who are trying to use the 12 platforms when there's far more trains than there are platforms, uh, and you realise just the point of vulnerability it is in the national network. So the idea is to release the pressure on New Street, and therefore it is no longer true that when New Street comes up, passengers from Edinburgh to Penzance 
are affected by the problems in Birmingham. And that's what happens at the moment. Passengers from London to Manchester, Edinburgh to Penzance. And the way that this is done in simple terms is two cords. Now, I didn't know what the word cord meant a few years ago. It's a posh rail industry word because they don't talk in English. They talk in all their <laughs> jargon. A posh word for a junction, a rail junction, a point, you might even call it. And the cords make more streets a much, much more significant station than it is now. Thus, taking trains out of New Street is the simple idea. The Western Cord, as it's called, links, and I'll try to describe it all very simply for you because there's quite a bit to this, uh, links uh, the Camp Hill line that we're just reopening, reopened by the end of this year, into Moor Street. At the moment, the Camp Hill line goes into New Street. And I was literally, this sort of brings the issue to a head, I was literally given a choice by Network Rail. If you want to open the Camp Hill line, Andy, there are not enough paths, as they call them, into New Street. So you will have to reduce the number of trains going from Coventry to Birmingham. And you just put your head in your hands and you think, we cannot be in this situation. But that was the deal struck about three years ago. That's the sort of issues that we face. So the cord is built. So not just our local services from Camp Hill that can be made more frequent, by the way, but the trains coming from Bristol, from Penzance, from Cardiff, from Hereford, they will all potentially go into Mall Street using that cord, which will be built just by Bordsley to make that connections. The second cord is then built connecting Moor Street Line, of course, to the Derby Line. Again, for those of you who know it well, if you're going out of the city, uh, out through uh, the new stations that we're planning at the Fort, Castle Bromwich, out to Derby, you go into New Street. The idea of this is that that line will also connect into Moor Street. So there'll be more paths available for trains from Derby, from Leicester. And I'll come back to Nottingham as a special issue in just a little time, but you can see the point again. There'll also be a big upgrade to Kings Norton Junction at Kings Norton Station. So that's the sort of physical engineering work. But what are the benefits of that? More seats, obviously, on those frequency, more reliability, as I've said, and you can see all the data on that in the report. You don't need me to go through that. But perhaps more exciting for customers. First of all, better connections at Moor Street. So it becomes like a hub station and vast capacity there to be unlocked. So if you're using the Snow Hill line at the moment, you will connect into all of those other services there. And of course, Moor Street will be just a pedestrian footbridge away from HS2. So you'll be able to come from the Bristol line, from the Derby line, get off at Moor Street, walk to Curzon Street there. So it makes sense of that. Then we will have increased frequency on the lines that I've already talked about, including the Camp Hill line, and the potentially with the works at Kings Norton, and certainly the MP for Northfield is obsessed with this, he keeps writing to me about this, <laughs> potentially extending the Camp Hill line out to Longbridge. And because we've got more capacity back into New Street, and because we've got this new junction at Kings Norton, we can go back to six trains an hour on the Cross City line. And given that we're putting new rolling stock on there, many, many more seats on the Cross City line than we had pre-COVID. And then I begin to get excited that with Camp Hill and the Fort, and potentially the Sutton Park line as well, because that connects around there into Aldridge, into Warsaw, Potentially, we have the third Cross City line. Obviously, we have the main one we call the Cross City line. We have the Snow Hill line. I see the third Cross City line coming from Camp Hill into Moor Street, out to the Fort, to Castle Brom, and all through Sutton. So that is there for us as well. But perhaps the most interesting bit of it is if you take lots of things out of New Street, you can then begin to think about what you put into New Street to replace it. And this is where West Midlands trains begin to get excited. So if currently you are travelling from Wolverhampton, from Warsaw, into University Station, which of course we've just spent a fortune on, we expect it to, more than we intended to spend actually, but never mind, we won't go there. Uh, 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 but that, obviously, that station serves so many institutions of university, the QA Hospital will be here because it's going to be coming known, the Health Innovation Campus, and we want more routes into university so you'll be able to go use university into New Street and then maybe out directly to Walsall, directly to Wolverhampton, so we get different routes coming into New Street. And it's when you begin to think about that that the business case for it begins to get really exciting because you then think about what offer you bring to the black country, which we know is less well-connected.
than other parts of our region. So that's actually physically what will happen. A couple of things that are not yet clear. First of all, Nottingham services. Um, Nottingham was going to be served by HS2 Eastern, as you will all know. That's also been scrapped. It was always the weakest business case within it, but quite rightly, uh, Midlands Connect and the Rail Alliance are saying we've still got to improve that. So a new part of Midland Rail Hub, and this is being worked on as we speak, we need to think in the light of HS2, how do we upgrade Nottingham services? And we've already talked, uh, the Rail Executive at the Transport Select Committee, about potentially West Midlands trains taking on the responsibility for services from Birmingham to the East Midlands, changing who actually operates them, operating them more frequently, more reliably. Remember, West Midlands Trains now the fourth best operator in the country, cross country and Avanti somewhere near the bottom. So I am very keen that we get more under the West Midlands flag than under some of the long-term operators. So all of that is still being thought about. And before any Coventrians in the room say you haven't said anything about Coventry, true, we have not. But the bit that is still being worked on separately to what's been agreed is this Coventry Leicester through Nuneaton Link. And I know that Midland, uh, uh, Midland Connect are very determined to do a separate business case about that. So I hope what you see as I run through it is that there's an, when you peel it back, there's an enormous amount to this. And when you come to the economic advantages of this, I do genuinely believe it's very, very substantial. And it sits as the partner, really, the baby son or daughter of HS2 and Moore Street, Curzon Street becomes the sort of hub of it all. So genuinely, uh, we've managed to put a case together for 1.75 billion where there is a strong return. And we've done a good job in making that case to government team together. And what I am now going to be saying to Mark Harper later this month is, OK, we've got the money. I want the diggers in the ground as quickly as possible to begin to see benefit in all the way that we have described. The bit he's studiously or it refused to answer yet is exactly when we can actually get network rail to start delivering on that. But I genuinely think it will be very soon. And combined with the certainty of HS2, we've literally got something that we've not dreamt of for decades in terms of the total rail investment across the West Midlands. So there we are. That's the story. And that's why I've been determined to get this particular one over the line. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Andy. And as a proud Coventrian, I'm really glad you mentioned Coventry then, because that would have been my first question if you, if you hadn't. Um, you've, you've done a really good, good just job describing what Midlands Rail Hub is in terms of the infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> what um, does it unlock for the region in terms of delivering wider economic potential and social outcomes? Yeah, so it, it's all very clear this. Uh, the business case can't just be based on an, an Iraq um, uh, engineer. It has to describe an economic, uh, uh, an economic case. Uh, and there's really, uh, you said a bit about in your introduction, there's really three key things. The first of all, increasing frequency uh, on existing lines. It is a proven point that if you have that, more people will use it, will choose to leave their car at home. It's just more reliable. And so there is all the advantages of public transport over cars. The second thing is new connections that are not there at the moment will again drive. It's about the sort of right back to the 18th century economists talked about how trade happens. If you connect places together, more business is done. That's what this is really all about. So whether it's for leisure, for work, for education, it just makes possibilities that are not there at the moment. And that's why the new lines have always been uh, justified. But then there's also, uh, there's also a, real, um, uh, there's a real social piece around this as well. Uh, some of the places are underserved at the moment, and that limits aspiration. So uh, where you put in a new link uh, and you actually say to people, you can be connected to this, you raise people's sort of opportunities, aspirations. That's the whole driving force behind the Black Country Metro. And some of the areas that we've talked about, weak links at the moment, and it will actually be, what's the word, an enabler, an empowerer. 
And, yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And the, the uh, entrepreneurs of the uh, 18th and 19th century who could have funded and built the railways knew exactly that. They built the railway, but they also built businesses around them to capture the benefits. And, and so Midlands Rail Hub, as you said, is about intra-regional connectivity. Uh, HS2 provides inter-regional connectivity. And the UK rail network is really heavily focused on connectivity to and from London. And the council parts of HS2 obviously would have connected the Midlands better to the northeast and northwest. Uh, we, you've talked publicly, including today, about the conversations you're having with Andy Burnham and Mark Harper uh, around what might be done to improve connectivity between Ma Manchester and Birmingham especially. What can you tell us about where you are in that conversation and yep. th where you think it might go? Watch Midlands Day tonight. Uh, Andy Burnham's just done Radio 4. You know, we've done everything. Sky, GB News, a lot. So... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's great that this story has captured people's imagination. But what we basically said today was that uh, the pair of us think that the decision that the government took was wrong. We know that. But you can't go back. They've taken that decision. But the problem of the second and third regions of the country, and of course we both joke we don't know which order they come, second or third. I have my answer. He has a different answer. Uh, they're both... They, they are already... The links between them are deeply congested, whether it be the M6 is full... And, of course, it's got nearly all of the freight and the pollution that goes with that road freight um, between uh, Birmingham and Manchester and vice versa. And, of course, the railway line between Birmingham and Manchester is, as everybody knows, one of the most congested parts of it, both in terms of passenger services. You try to get a seat on a train to Manchester. It's worse than anywhere else. And, of course, the number of, back to the jargon, the train paths on the actual route. So it is not satisfactory at the moment and if you take even modest growth, it is going to get far, far worse. So, simple language, something has to be done, Mr Government. And the other way, at the, the sort of something has to be done, is you think the government is spending, I don't know, £66 billion pounds is the uh, statement today, on HS1 as far as Birmingham. It's also spending a sum, probably more than that, ultimately, on Northern Powerhouse Rail. And so you've got high speed in the south, you've got high speed across the north, and you've got a gap in the middle. And the gap, actually, is the easiest and cheapest bit. Because no disrespect to Staffordshire or Cheshire, it's not as, it's not as uh, busy uh, in terms of people living there. So that is, there's no tunnelling. It's the simplest bit of it. So we are simply saying you have to join up these two pieces in some way. And what has been done by the private sector very, very quickly, and some of the biggest names in engineering, in design, in finance, in consultancy, they've all come forward to actually say, we will help you with this pro bono. We've commissioned it. They're doing the work. So it's, let me just go through them. Mace, Arcadis, um, uh, Arup, the biggest engineering company in the world, EY, Dragados, you name them. They've got a wonderful list of people who've come forward. And they are now saying the answer as to what happens is somewhere in the options that we've presented today. Some upgrade to the West Coast Main Line, maybe that's sufficient. Some bypassing of the West Coast Main Line or a brand new dedicated line that will not be the same specification as HS2. So there's an engineering solution and then there is a funding solution as the mix between public and private funding. And the really good news is that when we saw the Transport Secretary last week, he said, OK, I keep an open mind to this. I'm happy that you work with HS2 Limited, with the DFT, with Network Rail on all of their resources, and we have committed to present back our recommended answer to this uh, back by the end of March. So from where we were in Manchester in the beginning of October to where we are now, I am genuinely feeling very, very optimistic about it because whoever is in government, there's a problem that has to be solved and we're trying to bring a responsible answer to it. And you haven't asked me this question, but I will just put it for people to think there's something very interesting that it's taken two mayors of different political parties of different regions to come together to get this piece of work done. So we've talked, yeah, uh, agreed. We, we've talked a lot about transport, obviously. We talked about the, the, the Midland Rail Hub. Uh, but as well as transport, your other kind of main areas of powers and funding are around housing and skills. And Midland Rail Hub has the opportunity to unlock a huge amount of benefit in housing and in skills. Do you want to talk about that yeah. a little bit? So, you know, it's fascinating. People say, there's transport, there's housing, there's skills, there's net zero. They're actually all part of the same, pardon my bloody agenda. Uh, so and I would just, rather than me warble on about what we intend to do in the West Midlands, I would just, has anyone been to Japan? And in Japan, 
by the way. In Japan, the Shinkansen is not all funded by the state. There's some private sector contribution to that. Interesting, given the HS2 debate. Uh, and um, a Shinkansen station, you can hardly see the station. What you often see is a shopping centre or an office block. Interesting. Compare that with the design of Curzon Street here. Uh, and so actually, the agendas come together. And most importantly in Japan, along the line of the Shinkansen, you see where the housing is concentrated. So what this is actually saying is where we are building this new capacity. We expect to see a concentration of the housing and then surprise, surprise, you get a more sustainable community where people are not having to commute as long a distance. Japan is not, by the way, the right example of that. Uh, uh, and uh, so you get the environmental benefits as well. So certainly the CA's uh, view on this is we concentrate our development around these nodes of transport investment. And actually that, given something else I feel very strongly about, that is how we help protect the green belt in these areas. Yeah, and that goes well beyond the West Midlands as a, as yeah. a combined authority area, but into the shires and down to Bristol and up to Leicester and beyond. So yeah. really wide ranging <coughs> benefits for housing. Uh, and what about skills? So there is a skill shortage in construction and engineering, yeah. uh, as there are in many other industries. Yeah. Um, HS2 is doing a good job from our perspective of kind of getting a lot of apprentices into the industry and get, yeah. getting a consistency of workload. Yeah. Can Midland Rail Hub do something similar? Uh, I expect you to. We will be demanding that you do, frankly. So just the numbers for HS2, because they get a lot of bad press, but um, 12,000 jobs in the West Midlands uh, from HS2 at the moment. 1,400 apprentices have gone into HS2, and they are past the thousandth, and they're not necessarily apprentices, all of them, a thousandth previously unemployed person were now working for them. And they have now opened their programme with job centres across the region uh, to try to push those numbers on even further. So, you know, they can be criticised for many things, including control of their costs overall, but they cannot be criticised for the work that they've done to bring uh, job opportunities. And we will demand, in terms of how HS... Oh, sorry, Midland Rail Hub is delivered, that exactly the same applies. And the CA plays its role. All of our training budgets often being used with the... We've done a lot with the Tier 1 providers. Actually, in, we are often funding the training programmes that they put in place to make those numbers happen. And here we are right in the middle of National Apprenticeship Week, so yeah. it's an apt thing to be talking about. That's skills. why I know it's 1,400 <laughs> apprentices. Yeah. Okay, then, okay, here's a, a, a slightly small p political question. Um, large public sector investment in infrastructure doesn't always capture the public's imagination. It takes a long time to deliver, and the sums involved are astronomical. Um, and you don't get the benefits for a long time after the, the project is conceived. How do you think, as, a, as an industry, uh, construction, engineering, and all kind of the allied professions, can help build a case that will convince the public, not politicians, not treasury, but the public, that investment in infrastructure generally, but more specifically the Midland Rail Hub, is the, the right thing to be doing? Um, so you, you, you paint quite a negative picture there, but I think often when you put this to people to reflect on, they get that Britain's wealth was built through incredible infrastructure investment, often taken by the private sector, whether it be, you might think I'm bonkers here, but it was the first example, whether it be the canal, the railway, or the road system, all have driven that. And some of the most controversial uh, infrastructure projects have ended up being incredibly important to our growth and affluence, actually. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not in the negative camp about this. I'm in the camp that you have to sell the benefits and you actually then have to deliver with competence. Now, there is definitely a question about where the risk goes around all this. You know, the reason I'm so frustrated about HS2 is that uh, only us thought that we should build this as a statist enterprise. And then, of course, the Prime Minister canned it because there was too much money for the government. But in France... Uh, not apparently a country that has the same colour of government as the UK. It is the established norm for a public-private partnership to deal with um, their big infrastructure projects. The same in uh, Spain, equally often seen not as uh, free market as this country, certainly in many of the countries of Asia. So it is absolutely normal for us to bring more private investment into these pieces. 
And so one of the things I really want out of the work we're doing on the son of HS2 is for that principle to be more established. And, you know, uh, if you think of some of the wonderful, it is a hospital part of infrastructure, I would argue it probably has been, actually. Uh, and some of those projects have been privately funded as well. Now, there's all the debate about whether PFI overpaid. But again, there are models that actually bring that private investment there. So I think we've actually got to double down on selling the case and then thinking more laterally about how we do it. Well, that's perhaps a really good place to end because it segues really nicely into what we're going to be fo focusing on in the panel, which is what are those benefits beyond the direct economic and transport benefits uh, and how we can sell them. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your candour and views. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, could our panel come and join us, please? And will you excuse me if I don't stay for the rest of the session? My apologies, but uh, I have to go and slay something else. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, welcome to our panel. Um, right. I think, Andy, it's described in quite a lot of detail what Midland Rail Hub is, but Karen, I'm, I'm going to come to you first, and if there's anything you want to add to what Andy said about what Midland Rail Hub is from a transport perspective and what it is you want it to uh, achieve from Midland Stair. So introduce yourself, please, and then tell us what Midland Rail Hub is. Yeah, thanks, Tim, uh, and good evening, everyone. So I'm Karen Heckenstall, and I'm the head of integrated transport at uh, Midland Connect. I've been there for about two and a half years. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Midlands Connect is the subnational transport body for the whole of the Midlands. Um, sorry, thank you. Um, apparently I've got a loud enough voice that you could all hear me at the back anyway. Um, <laughs> but a mic is probably useful. Um, so um, so, so Midland, Midlands Connect uh, looks at a much wider geography than uh, the, the Mayor Street does. So our, our uh, geography runs from the Welsh border in the west all the way across the Lincolnshire coast in the east. So uh, our focus is slightly wider. And uh, from a Midlands Rail Hub perspective, we've always had three key objectives that are very much outcome-based. So and yeah, uh, Andy has given you a really quite detailed breakdown of exactly what infrastructure we need within the combined authority area. But I'm going to bring us back to the reasons why we're doing this and the objectives behind why we're doing this. Um, so for, first and foremost, Andy was absolutely right. This, this was always about, and always will be, about improving connectivity to HS2 and giving people across the Midlands the opportunity of making the most of that HS2 connection. Um, the second most important objective uh, from a Midlands Connect perspective is significantly improving east-west connectivity. Um, so for those of you who do happen to cross from the, west of, from the west of the Midlands to the east of the Midlands, you will know that those rail connections, and actually if you try to do it by road as well, are very, very poor. Um, so we absolutely want to and need to improve that city-to-city city connectivity between Birmingham and the likes of Leicester, Nottingham, but also some of the other cities, uh, towns and cities further afield within the West Midlands, so places like Worcester and Hereford as well. So it's very much about bringing all of those big towns and cities in the Midlands closer together by improving frequencies and journey times, exactly as, as Andy articulated. But that east-west connectivity has always been an absolute fundamental objective to Midlands Rail Hub. Um, and I think Andy articulated very well the third objective, which is about unlocking rail capacity in uh, central Birmingham. Um, and that is, again, very congested. Um, and there is literally no, no room for any more trains. Um, so in order to drive economic growth, to give people opportunity to access jobs within Birmingham, we absolutely need to unlock that capacity. And that infrastructure that, that Andy described, um, in, enabling access, better access to Moore Street, is absolutely part of that. Um, so th th that's kind of the outcomes and the objectives we're looking for from, from Midlands Rail Hub. Um, and uh, yeah, I think yeah, that, that, that probably covers it in, t in addition to what the mayor said, actually, Tim, for now. But uh, obviously, I'm sure I'll bring back more stuff later on. So, Thanks very much. And 
it's interesting. The civil engineering has come up a few times tonight, and I, I am a civil engineer, uh, but actually none of our panel are, I don't think, unless anyone corrects me. <laughs> um, uh, and that's intentional, actually, because we, we want to talk less about what Midlands Rail Hub is in terms of the bits and pieces that are going to go in the ground, and more about what it enables. So what I'm going to ask the, the, the um, panel to do, starting at Sandy from working this way, uh, is to introduce yourselves, uh, a couple of words about yourself, uh, and what you think is one of the biggest non-transport um, benefits that we could realise from the Midland Rail Hub. Thanks, Tim. And no, I'm not a civil engineer, <laughs> a town planner, but I'm sure there's plenty of those are in the room as well today. Um, it's, it's really hard following Andy because he's probably said all the stuff that I was going to talk about, given that, you know, he covers the same geography that I do. But one of the things that I will focus on is around the capacity constraint at New Street. Um, and I think the technical term is it's stuffed. Um, well, you cannot get anything else into New Street. Now, that poses a real challenge for the types of objectives that we have for Transport for West Midlands, which is about improving uh, accessibility and connectivity across the region, access to new public transport services. We've done a lot of work on our emerging LTP, which is about delivering 15-minute neighbourhoods connecting to a 45-minute region. And what this means, it's about how do we walk, wheel and scoot to our fixed lines, like our railway lines, our metro lines, our bus rapid transit lines, to access the entire region. And that's important for accessing jobs, it's around housing, it's around accessing healthcare, access to leisure, it's all the things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. And as, uh, as someone who's worked in transport for many, many years, more than I care to remember, we don't do transport for transport's sake, we do transport because it underpins our daily lives every day. Now, one of the ways in which Midlands Rail Hub will absolutely support that is new stations on the Sutton Park Line, on the Camp Hill Line, so areas like Borsal Heath, being able to actually have railway stations that have decent uh, frequency and capacity to actually make them attractive options. Now, this is important because the West Midlands has a strong history of lower productivity when you compare it to other areas across the UK, but also across Europe. A lot of that does come down to we have real inequalities in levels of educational attainment across the region and access to skills and education is a big part of that. What the new, this additional rail capacity will do, the new stations in a number of our areas, important corridors across the region, will fundamentally change that level of accessibility for a lot of people. So giving those new opportunities and fundamentally changing where their lives can take them in terms of access to new skills, employment opportunities, and indeed um, supporting the wider growth of the region. So I'll leave it there and let others come in with a few more, few more points. Thanks. Over to you, Joe. almost that you're investing in a green method of transport and therefore that's enough but that isn't enough what else can you do <coughs> uh, last but not least James uh, thanks Tim and um, well thanks thanks to everyone else because sometimes it's the, the benefit of being the social guy so I'm James Beard and I'm Mott's technical director for social outcomes representing the Midlands Rail Alliance today um, sometimes the benefit of being the guy who goes last is I get to correct everybody else because they're all <laughs> civil engineers and I have to remind everybody that it's not about concrete and steel but it's about people and it's about their, their families and their jobs and their lives. 
but we've all kind of already done that already. Um, so what's what's exciting for me, and what I think the, the the real the opportunity here is focused on the fact that we are very much still at the beginning of a process, um, and we have a, a real um, access point here to begin to develop this this project outwards with community at its heart, with people at its centre. Um, really bringing them into the way that decisions are made, into ownership of the decisions that we take, um, and to place the, the people who will benefit from the services that we are supporting, the connectivity that we've talked about, and the economic aspirations that we, we are kind of driving with this project into the very centre, to give, to give that ownership to the people who are going to be affected by it. Thank you. Well, some violent agreement, it seems, uh, which is a good place to be, I suppose. Um, we've, we've talked about some of the big benefits. Um, what are some of the smaller benefits that might, might not be so big in scale that they're going to drive <coughs> economic, you know, economic growth on a regional level or um, social change on a kind of you know, a seismic level? What are some of the smaller things that Midlands Rail Hub could do that will make real differences to some people's lives. They're not looking at the macro, not looking at everybody, but what are some of the small benefits that might be unlocked, either from social or, or from um, environmental? So open to anybody who wants to go first. I'll come in, Tim. Um, again, coming from the perspective of local stations and the roles that they play within our communities. Um, we've done quite a lot of work over the years as stations being places and how do we turn them away from not just an access point onto the transport system, but an outward facing community asset and getting people to get involved around the things that happen with, with railway stations. We've seen really great examples of local planting, local ownership, local accountability around, around small stations in communities. Just goes to show that there is a real sense of community around these hubs as part of the transport system. And that's something that we would absolutely want to continue to encourage. And that this sits hand in hand with the 15-minute neighbourhoods linking into the 45-minute region. Sorry, I'm going to keep on talking about transport and the LTP. Um, but it, it goes back to the things around how do we encourage the, the good accessibility of those stations, thinking about walking, the wheeling, the scooting in our local communities that actually then encourage the access to those stations. So using the stations, in, not in the grandest sense of economic growth and everything else, but that, so, that community impact and the social impact that they will continue to have as really important community assets will is, is something that we're, we're really keen to see continue. Um, if, yeah, if I, it's okay if I come in. Um, so I'd like to talk specifically about um, two locations at the periphery of the line, um, one being Hereford and one being Leicester. Um, and both Hereford and Leicester are at the very, very bottom end in terms of um, social mobility. Uh, so they are both social mobility cold spots. I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but basically social mobility is a measure that, that uh, informs whether the people who grow up in those communities have good opportunities to go on in the future, to get good jobs and good education. Um, and actually, that for me, that's one of the really key things that Midlands Rail Hub can do, is that it absolutely opens up those opportunities in some of those slightly more remote places and really brings on the opportunities for the, the young people growing up in those places to actually believe that they have a future that is further education, um, high-paid jobs, good health and all of that kind of stuff. And I think, again, you know, it com comes back to what James said before. This is absolutely about the people. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about the railway at all. It's about, the, it's about the people that the railway can and should serve and the opportunities that it brings to them. Um, so those, those more remote places um, are absolutely pivotal to, to the success of Midlands Rail Hub. I think we have to look at some of the really difficult... Uh, benefits to measure uh, things around well-being and how general connectedness makes us feel you know on the back of, of lockdown there has been a, a real awakening around mental health and around I mean all of us here will know how stressed we get uh, when we are in back-to-back -back traffic anyone that's had a ventured into uh, you know the realms of the M25 recently will see how everyone's thumping their steering wheels and getting stressed but the ability to, to have a, a, a network system that is connected, um, as Karen correctly says, to areas of, of true 
low social mobility is a very strong signal to the people that live in those communities that you matter, that you are connected to everywhere else. Um, and it, it's almost subliminal messaging, um, which is really important. And equally for young people who today, you know, they are the generation that are emerging into the workforce. They are the ones that are going to have to live with the reality of climate change, the reality of, of what has been created. Um, but they don't have a lot of choice around how they can act in more sustainable ways. If they're more connected to, air, to uh, infrastructure that allows them to travel sustainably, where they don't have to think about, you know, I can't afford an electric vehicle, for example, that is going to fundamentally alter how they feel about their future and we've got some very terrifying statistics about young people suffering from eco-anxiety that I think we don't talk about enough and don't realize how um, you know infrastructure projects as significant as this one can actually have that subliminal benefit because it's difficult to measure but we should we should recognize it and because it's difficult to measure and monetize doesn't get talked about mm. in the business case which is where you get the funding from so it's never a focus yeah it's an in interesting point um, I think just, just to build briefly on, on Karen and Joe's points, it's that, that connectivity piece is part of the Im embedded value of the, of the, of the project and of what it's going to deliver. But it's going to take £1.7 billion pounds worth of investment to deliver that. And there is a huge amount that we can do to support social mobility through skills, employment, apprenticeships and other things along the way. So we have a double opportunity here, not just to deliver something in, in eight to ten years time when the project is complete or at the, in the intervals between now and then when parts of it are complete. All along the way, there's opportunities for people in the communities affected by the project to secure a, a better future for themselves and to, to support that social mobility. But we've, presumably, we've got to grab it, and we've got to grab it soon, which was probably my point about how we need to get going straight away on this. Thanks. So, so we've talked about <clears throat> what some of the big benefits are, what some of the smaller or maybe, let's say, more ignored rather than the smaller benefits are. Um, have you, as a panel, got any um, uh, examples you can bring from other, in other large infrastructure projects, which doesn't have to be transport, could be water or energy or communications, whatever, from around the UK or around the world, where you've seen a real strong focus on consciously identifying and capturing those benefits and then making sure that you shout about them as well? Well, I actually think that's what's really exciting about the Midlands Rail Alliance. You know, we represent 105 years' worth of history of, of delivering just that. And if you look at, you know, the, the, six, the track record successes of Balfour Beatty, Mott MacDonald, Skanska, we're all very aligned on the fact that when we deliver these infrastructure projects, that, that the social benefit, the environmental benefit has got to be, in, you know, an intrinsic part of that, whether you're talking about, you know, with Balfour Beatty with our Building New Futures or Skanska with their Green Book or everything that you do at Mott McDonald. I think, I think there's almost two examples to point to, to be perfectly honest. I know I've got a couple of my team here that would be championing all the work that we do around schools engagement, early careers, apprenticeships. We had some of the stats that came from um, Andy around HS2, over a thousand people that were unemployed now into employment. Um, there's a lot to choose from. I'll bring in, well, it's going to be transport. Um, but, um, <laughs> be proud, Sandy, be proud. Um, you know, it comes back to the articulation of what is it that we're trying to achieve. And in the current climate of costs and inflation, lots of challenges in terms of major project delivery, it's easy to sort of think about, oh, we need to go back and change the scope or let's cut our scope back. But in many occasions, when you do that, you lose a lot of the benefits, whether they're the economic benefits, the social benefits, the environmental benefits. So over the past few years, we've worked as a brand new concept. Um, probably every consultant in the room has probably worked on Sprint Bus Rapid Transit at some point or had something to do with it. But we've taken that from a concept of improving bus across the West Midlands. And it wasn't about making bus any quicker. It was about making bus more reliable. And if you make bus more reliable, you get jo reliable journey times, you get more people wanting to use it, and you can improve accessibility across the region. Our first line uh, runs from Warsaw to Solihull, um, and is a brand new concept in terms um, of um, express bus style services. Again, going back to the point around being clear on what it is that we were trying to achieve, what the business case set out to do. and. For all the years that I've worked in transport, it's been great to see that as we've been doing the monitoring over the first, first year or so, 
we're actually getting the types of improvement that we expected to see. So we're generating the benefits. And this all comes back to making those case for investments because it, sometimes it can be all very theoretical until you get to the point where you can actually show that it did what it was meant to do. So that's one example. We've delivered an awful lot over the past few years as a result of the Commonwealth Games. Over the next few years, we have more devolved funding coming through the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement, the second wave of that carrying on, so giving us a longer time period to plan and deliver over. And that allows us to work in a far more integrated way. So when we talk about Midlands Rail Hub, we talk about improvements to bus, we talk about improvements to cycling and walking, we can really focus on this in a far more integrated way and make sure we're getting the best out of these, these infrastructure projects in a, through that coordination integration, not just focusing on the transport benefits, but those much broader and wider benefits that all the panel members have been, been discussing just a short while ago. And can I ask, on that Walsall to <coughs> uh, Solihull uh, sprint route, you've talked about collecting data and you know, being confident things more reliable and that leading to hopefully behaviour change. Have, you, have we, you also spoken to people, the users of the service, and found out how it's affected them? Yes, we've done quite a lot of user testing, uh, user surveys, one around the at-stop infrastructure. So what are the satisfaction rates of using the new metro-style shelters, um, getting sort of 90% plus in terms of the satisfaction rate for doing that. We're also seeing a switch in terms of some people choosing to use more bus more often, so that behavioural change point of view, because the, buses, the bus journey times are more reliable. Um, I'm not sure it can be fully validated, but from National Express's point of view on the A45 section, they said the only times hadn't been that quick since the 70s. So it goes to show how targeted interventions can make a big difference. Karen James, any other examples for other projects to learn from? Yes, uh, if I could. Um, so um, we, we do actually have another major infrastructure investment um, on the railway in the Midlands going on actually at the moment, uh, which is Midland Mainline Electrification. And uh, that's been a really long time in coming as well, by the way. I mean, I mean the number of times that's been cancelled and put back on and cancelled and put back on by various governments, um, I think probably breaks all the records. Um, but the reason I shout it out is because actually um, I, I sit as a, a passive observer to it at the moment. And I'm, 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 I'm very impressed by the, both the Network Rail and DFT teams who are clienting and delivering this project because actually they have a really clear vision, um, not just of the infrastructure and not just of the benefits, but actually of the legacy of that project. And I think we should always be thinking about legacy of projects. And from an electrification point of view, it's yes, it's about driving down the cost of electrification, establishing that rolling program of electrification so that actually once we've done middle and main on electrification, we can do more. And there were other electrification schemes specifically mentioned in the Network North document as well. But actually, the lesson for me that can be learned from that is the legacy that Midlands Rail Hub can leave in the same vein. How can we reduce the cost and in, improve the, the pace at which we deliver Midlands Rail Hub? And how can we engage better with the supply chain to do that? So for me, that's a real, that's a real critical success factor of Midlands Rail Hub and a really good example of a project that we can absolutely learn from that's very, very local to us. Um, perhaps a, a non-transport sector example. Sorry, Sandy. Um, <laughs> but work, working across different infrastructure sectors, we, we see great examples from energy and from, from water where that focus on legacy can really deliver something more than the, the intended bricks and mortar sort of aspect of, of, of infrastructure. So if you take reservoir development, for example, strategic water resources on a regional and national level, you, you have the potential to entirely focus your delivery process on risk and ensure, ensuring that you, uh, you minimize risk to the extent that you are able to secure your planning consents, you're able to deliver the, the resilient water infrastructure that's needed. Um, but if you don't also pick out the, the, the dimension that focuses on legacy and look at the opportunities that come with delivering new water resource infrastructure. You know, you are, if fundamentally, you're delivering new blue and green infrastructure with a reservoir project. You are providing new potential walking and cycling routes, new opportunities for commerce, for water sports, for other kinds of activity. 
and a purely risk-driven approach will see you look straight past those to how much it's going to cost you to buy out the landowners. Instead of thinking about where we might locate a new facility that could support kids from the centre of Birmingham or kids from the centre of the local city to get out into nature to experience water sports and other things that they might not have otherwise been able to do. So focusing on what's, what, what ultimately a, a piece of infrastructure could be rather than what you know it has to be at its core is, is kind of part of how we can make a project like Midlands Rail Hub really, really shine and make that legacy stick. So um, the, the way... We've all talked tonight, I think, is kind of almost preaching to the converted because the people in this room are a self-selected group of people who are interested in infrastructure, in rail infrastructure specifically, probably. Um, one of the questions I asked Andy was how we can build the case to the public who just don't care. They care about getting on with their lives in the most convenient and easy and cost-effective way. Really, that's what most people care about. How can we build a case for the Midland Rail Hub for the person who isn't interested in the project, just is interested in making their lives easier and cheaper. Engagement is a big part of any project. Um, getting out into the communities where that project is going to impact. And it isn't just around the end product, it is the disruption that often comes during that construction phase, which is a really easy time to lose some of that goodwill that you get from communities, even though there are long-term benefits, the legacy that will come. Um, I've sat through meetings with residents and businesses, and I've defaulted to the big strategic narrative. And you're absolutely right, Tim, they don't really care. What they're really bothered about is what happens on their doorstep, what's happening outside my house, how do I get to that new bit of infrastructure, am I going to lose anything? So that early engagement is absolutely crucial. And I think we get a bit of bit of um, stick for this because we often get labelled as you've, you've decided what you're going to do and whatever we say is, is irrelevant. But we've got some really good examples where we've improved, changed, rescoped projects because of that really important community engagement and getting people who live and work, visit those areas to actually give their, give their views around how we actually make that better um, and actually make it more meaningful for them to actually use it. So thinking about what happens on their doorstep. The other bit that I'll, I'll just mention as a bit of a, a bit of an anecdote is, as transport professionals, most of us, we get obsessed with technical drawings and engineering drawings. And I remember going into consultation events with all these engineering drawings up on the wall, and 95% of people who walked through the door couldn't read them, couldn't understand them. So a massive lesson learnt was, right, we'll get a comms agency in and make these really, really easy to understand so people can identify where they live and what's happening on their doorstep. Well, while the mic's being passed over, I'll just add to that. I mean, I absolutely agree. There's, there's a huge amount of engagement that we need to do over the next five, five or so years to help people to understand um, what Midlands Rail Hub means to them. Um, I talk a lot about, um, I suppose, how, how do we go about incentivizing people to change their behaviours? So uh, the, the rail hub, yes, people won't understand the infrastructure and they won't necessarily even understand the service patterns and the changes to the service patterns. Um, and, and we could do that and no one could change their behaviours. But actually, if we talk to them about, well, what, how, how can this improve their lives and, and what it genuinely means to them to be able to access those, those jobs, that education, become more healthy, use active modes to, to reach the stations and all of that kind of stuff... Um, but it's, it's a huge PR campaign that we've got to do. Um, and uh, yes, as, as transport planners, I don't think that's in our skill set, but we've got people in all our organisations for whom that behaviour change and that comms piece absolutely is in their skill sets. And we really need to make the most of, most of those other skill sets as part of this. Trust. Yes, engagement. But I don't think I'm going to shock anyone in the room by saying that I think... Uh, the consumer trust in government in big brands is probably at an all-time low. And if we're going to engage a local community on the sustainable, holistic sustainable benefits of this program, then the, then the narrative has got to come from partners that are trusted to deliver a truthful, honest and frank message. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, a brilliant example of, of something that's very near to us right now. I'll, I'll use this as a brilliant example. 
Why, why have we got water on here in cans? I bet you all think it's more sustainable than a plastic bottle because it's been sold as such, but it's not. This is why there's a lack of trust with consumers around when we try and sell sustainable benefits to them. So it, the language has got to come, the narrative has got to come from the right partners without bias, with, with truth around the holistic benefits, the trade-offs, because there's no entire sustainable solution. So engagement, absolutely, but it's got to come first from a source of trust. I don't think I've got much to add to that, really, other than to say that th it all feels like this boils down to th that trust piece and establishing that social license to operate and to deliver a, a project like this, whether it is about working with those who are going to be affected in a, in a more negative way because they're going to be, you know, they're going to be li living in the shadow of a large infrastructure project for, the, for, for several years, or um, selling the, 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 kind of the, the benefits to local communities who, who will stand to benefit from the activities of the project, whether it's during construction, so it's, it's, it's supporting that social mobility, or making those connections, getting people to work, getting people to school, getting people to hospital. Um, and I think it's... It's, almost, it's a tapestry of all of those things, isn't it, that builds that trust. It's, it's, it's talking and communicating with people. Um, it is following through on what you say. A, a, a word I was subjected to a lot earlier in the week was integrity. And, you know, w without that, without that follow through, we, we end up, um, well, adrift, I think, in terms of our relationship with the people who need to be on board to enable us to deliver a project of this scale. I won't <clears throat> ask you why you were subjected to the word integrity so much earlier this week. Um, right, I've got a, one more question for the panel, and then we'll open it up for everyone, so get your thinking hats on. Uh, and James, we keep on coming to you last, so I'm going to come to you first. Uh, put, imagine yourself in 2035. Midland Rail Hub has been delivered safely, on time, and under budget. Uh, and it's been operating for a few years, so lots of boxes ticked. Apart from those things, what does success look like? I, I think... It, for something like this, success is something that is tangible. It's something that you can see. It's something that you can touch, and it's something that you can feel. If we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna follow through and, and deliver on that that trust, people are going to want to and need to see something at the other end of it. And if that is something that really does deliver better, faster east-west connections through the second largest city in the country, then, yep, that, that's one of the things that we can do. But also, um, it's people feeling that they have access to those connections, and whether that is about accessible and inclusive design, or it's about, you know, feeling that you are enabled and empowered to make those journeys, or that it's that you have access to new opportunities that you didn't have before, because the transport's affordable, we haven't really said much about affordability, um, then it, those, those things are meaningful and actual um, outcomes. And if people can feel those and, 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 and grab them, then that, that's what success, I think, looks like for a lot of people. I'll go next, that's fine. Um, so I think um, we're already seeing in Birmingham the legacy of HS2. There are already organisations, companies, big businesses who are coming and settling in Birmingham um, immediately around, um, well, where we are now, uh, down over near the Curzon Street site, down in Digbeth. There's huge levels of development going on there. What I would like to see as a result of Midlands Rail Hub, and actually before those trains are operating, before that those cords are built, is that is, is new development, but not in Birmingham, I want to see those new developments in Worcester, in Hereford, in Leicester, in Nottingham, because actually that's what this is all about. It isn't necessarily people coming into Birmingham. It's making those other communities more vibrant as well. Jo? Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. You know, success, you know, project's been delivered and it's ticked the economic box, brilliant, but then socially what we've got is we've got businesses... That have, are not just based in London. You know, they've got satellite sites in other areas or they've relocated fully to other areas and therefore they're flowing staff between all parts of the UK, true diversity, people actually moving about. Um, and also simultaneously, where we've got a, 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 um, a new um, rail infrastructure project that has also really looked at how we can utilise the Green Verge estate either side of the railway in order to have 
true biodiversity restoration. You know, those fantastic strips of land that really are just crying out to be used for effective habitat for the, the flora and fauna that we simply can't survive without. And then you have all three in balance. So it's probably going to be more of a summary, actually. But for me, what does success look like? And I think throughout the stuff that Andy said, the panel's spoken about, there's probably five key things that we should see of, because of a, a project of this scale and what it will unlock in terms of other investment that will happen. It will turn the dial on things like levelling up and thinking about the communities that we have across the West Midlands. It will have a big difference in terms of placemaking um, and what we see happening in some of our areas. It will have to do something around financial sustainability um, and reducing the cost of transport and subsidy on the public purse. So how do we get more people? How do we make this more commercially viable? It will have positive impacts on the environment because we will be taking people away from private car use, hopefully, um, but also encouraging more sustainable active modes accessing the rail system. So there's, there's a number of, of, of things there which are, are really important. And one of the areas that we've, we've touched on quite a lot, which is the last one that I wanted to mention, is around that economic success. And I'm not just thinking about the broader economic benefits, but what does that mean at a very micro level to individuals, that social mobility? How is it having an economic impact on them? So those are the things that I would like to see uh, happen in 2035. Thank you very much. Right, over to the floor. I think, has Lydia got a, a roving mic? Or you have to take one off the panel. Uh, and hands up, sorry. Uh, I'm going to quick get my question time description. <laughs> That's on now. So over there in the centre, Lydia. Yeah. Hi there. <coughs> um, thank you to the panel and to yourself, uh, Tim. Now, we've talked about how effective, how we can effectively communicate the benefits of public transport. Um, can you just comment on the efforts that the industry is making um, in order to make rail travel more affordable? Over the panel. Particularly for the end users, that is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bit left field, that one, um, but I, I'll take it first. Um, I mean, there are there are um, lots of lots of work streams going on in the background. Um, Midlands Connect aren't necessarily directly involved in any of them at the moment, uh, but we have reasonable oversight of of some of them, kind of from a from a distance. Um, I think two things I'll specifically mention. So, uh, in terms of um, the rail reform. Um, that, that is being led by GBRTT at the moment. There is a fares reform program going on. Um, as I said, I don't know. I don't know the details, but the, the, there is a very high level of awareness of that affordability aspect of travelling by, by by rail in particular. Um, so there is work going on in the background on that. Um, I, I'll, I might refer, de defer to Sandeep to talk specifically about what West Midlands Rail Executive are doing as well, because they also are also doing some work, uh, but I won't, uh, won't talk in detail. Um, the other thing I will mention, uh, and this is a little bit more um, within Midlands Connect space, I think is the importance of um, uh, multimodal integration and in particular ticketing integration. Um, and again, there's a lot of work being done uh, locally, again, co combination of Transport for West Midlands and Midlands Connect, uh, looking at introducing a smart ticketing programme initially on the bus and tram network. Um, and again, I don't want to st steal Sandeep's thunder too much because he can probably provide some details. Um, but again, Midlands Connect are working with GBRTT to uh, look at how that can be rolled out in the long term on the rail network as well. Um, and I think what we're really keen to do is actually to make sure that we've got something in place in terms of that multimodal ticketing product um, so that actually when Midlands Rail Hub does start, we've got that in place so that actually we've already got some of those complementary investments going on so that actually there's a smart ticketing system in place for Midlands Rail Hub users. So they're not just seeing infrastructure, but they're seeing changes to that sort of fares and ticketing structure as well. Um, but Sandeep, do you want to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff yeah, that you're doing? Absolutely, and um, it's absolutely acknowledged that the affordability of rail, not just rail, public transport is an issue, and it's even probably hardest felt at the moment, given 
lots of pressures on, on incomes and costs. Uh, we've seen hyperinflation across a whole range of things. That just doesn't impact the delivery of these projects. It impacts everyone in their day-to-day -day lives. But transport is such an important part, and the conversations are ongoing at a national level around the rail reform, uh, the fares reform. Um, West Midlands Rail Executive is working very closely with GBRTT around how they continue on that journey but recognise the local impact of that. <coughs> In terms of the ticketing, and this, these are the things that we probably have more within our control, is introducing more effective uh, ticket options, more integrated ticket options, so we're not thinking about everyone having to buy single tickets for every part of the journey that they want to make. So how do we get to that integrated uh, ticketing offer? Uh, for those of you who are from the West Midlands, we'll have heard about the Swift, uh, Swift card and the Swift offering that we have. Uh, that is multimodal ticketing across a range of modes. Not quite as smart as Oyster yet, but we are working through that. But if you do have a Swift ticket, you can use a, a whole range of, well, you can use all public transport in the West Midlands and the West Midlands cycle hire uh, as, part of your, as part of your ticket. That work will continue to expand out, as Karen has spoken about, as we talk about that wider geography. And how does it work, particularly on the periphery outside the West Midlands metropolitan area? where you get those biggest differences in, in some of the fares and the pricing structures. So it's a combination of measures that will need to come together to address that wider issue of, of rail, uh, rail fares and affordability. But again, coming at it from a, a TFWM point of view, it isn't just about rail, it is about how we have an integrated transport offer that works for the residents and the businesses of the West Midlands. I, I might add something to this as well, <clears throat> which is that Public transport, because you pay at the point of use, is seen as something that needs to be self-sustaining commercially. We don't have that same conversation about road travel. Uh, roads are not profit-making or breaking even. They're seen as a public service. So the way we differentiate between modes of transport is, kind of, is quite um, arbitrary in this country. Um, and that's probably a national conversation to have. It's not, it's not something we can solve in this room, but we can be part of the voice talking to government, government about that. Um, there's another question down... Here, Lydia. Um, still here in the blue jacket. Thank you, Dominic Stanford from Devcoms. We're a political engagement and community engagement specialists. Um, we talked quite a bit about national government supporting the Midlands Rail Hub. Evidently, we've got a very pro mayor uh, in the room as well, or formerly in the room. Um, the missing part of that government landscape is local government, and obviously, there's a huge number of local authorities across the rail network that we're talking about here. How do they influence the landscape? How challenging is it to bring all of them on board with, with common visions, and, and how do you go about that? If I take that one first, um, they all seem to be coming to me first. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about our comms team. I hinted that they are uh, pretty amazing people. Um, and from a Midlands Rail Hub perspective, it, it's absolutely Midlands Connect's responsibility to kind of do that coordination of both um, national level MPs, um, but also local councillors. Um, so, um, I, I mean, we, 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 we do a, have a very active program of engagement, not just on Midlands Rail Hub, but also on other programmes. Uh, I, I was very pleased to hear the Mayor mentioning um, our Coventry Nest Not Nottingham scheme at all, which has very high political profile. Um, but it's really just about, again, it comes back to helping uh, the MPs and the local councillors to understand exactly what benefits Rail Hub will offer to their constituents. Um, so we, we, we very much see ourselves breaking it down, sort of almost on a station by station level and going, actually, this is what precisely it means for this station and that station and the other station. Um, and, by, and by doing it that way, um, it really helps to kind of focus the attention um, on um, making those kind of more, you know, sort of escalating that sort of lobbying uh, that the MPs can then take up to to the to the, to the Secretary of State, so Mark Harper, Hugh Merriman, uh, and and how and how that works. But we, I mean, essentially, we engage at all levels um, politically, um, from those very local councillors all the way up to the Secretaries of State, um, and it has been successful so far, we believe. Joe, do you want to add something and then we'll go back to the floor? Yeah, just I think Karen's absolutely right about the localised messaging. And this is where the industry partners can lend their support. Um, one of the big shifts in thinking around how you deliver 
long-lasting, meaningful social impact, so it's still there, even when industry leaves, is through that regional approach. And one of the things that we've been doing is, is actually restructuring the way that we run our social impact teams so that they are more regionally focused. Because what is going to be important and deliver long-lasting value um, you know, for, for Nottingham is going to be totally different from Birmingham, which is going to be different from more of the outlying towns and cities. So that localised localized messaging is really important. But traditionally, we tend to do more broad brush and hope that it lands. But, um, you know, if, if it's like when you talk for too long. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, when you're talking about a, a project and, and the real boon of this project is that social impact, then we've really got to look at it in its smallest detail at as local level as we can possibly go to. Oh, of course. Of course. I was just going to say the combined authority. So yeah. given that we have the leaders of the seven councils on the combined authority, we've obviously got um, the non-constituent members in the wider area, how that interfaces with the, the wider Midlands Connect geography. But that's where a lot of that detail can be dis discussed at a local level. And everyone can understand the impact and the benefits, the opportunities that will come as a result of a major infrastructure project like this and is part of the decision making. <laughs> I think we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. Uh, I'm going to go over here first and then at the back over there, I'm afraid. Sorry. Thank you, and thanks, panel, for some really interesting insights. So, as someone who's worked in both rail and road, it does frustrate me a little that we have this narrative of rail versus road rather than making best use out of both. So it's with that in mind that I want to ask the panel that... A lot of the conversation tonight has been around communities and people and social mobility. So I'm going to turn the conversation to freight. So as two-thirds of the country's freight travel on 2% of the country's roads, is this really important project going to make a difference in that? Karen, I think it's to you again, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Karen. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, so... Um, Actually, um, I'll probably be I'll probably be quite honest. Um, Midlands Rail Hub on its own, um, uh, or certainly parts of Midlands Rail Hub, have lim limited freight opportunities. But let me pick out just just a couple of key ones. Um, and uh, apologies if I go too technical for some of the audience here. Um, so uh, one of the one of the key freight benefits, um, if you think about the route between Birmingham, Kings Norton, and Worcester. There's quite a famous, very steep gradient on that section of line, which is called the Licky Incline. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're doing um, is to make sure that actually um, passenger trains aren't held up by freight trains on that section. Um, that probably doesn't necessarily benefit freight, but it certainly be it, it allows it allows more capacity basically on that section of network. Um, uh, more importantly, from a freight perspective, is actually on the eastern side where we are going to significantly unlock Water Autumn Junction, um, which is a major, major pinch point for freight. It's near um, access to several of the West Midlands depots, so um, I'll probably forget them all. Um, <laughs> Kingsbury certainly is the key one there, and the, and the access to the, to the, um, the, the other kind of um, freight yard there. God, my brain's gone, sorry, I can't remember their names. Um, and, and actually, th that, that will definitely have a significant benefit in terms of the freight capacity running on the rail network. Um, what I will shout out, and apologies for the, for the shameless plugging once again of our Coventry to Leicester and Nottingham scheme, because actually that one is one that is absolutely beneficial to freight, because that opens up essentially a brand new path on one of the key strategic freight networks for, from the south, basically the Southampton through the Midlands and up to, the, up to Yorkshire. Um, and actually, if we're able to build the dive under at Nuneaton, then freight doesn't have to come past Water Orton anymore. So those, the two schemes together are very complementary of each other. So we, that w the two together create significantly more freight capacity, which is why, uh, and again, thanks to the Mayor for shouting it out earlier, um, that although Coventry, Leicester, Nottingham isn't part of Midlands Rail Hub, it absolutely complements complements the scheme um, because the two of them together are, are significantly beneficial to freight. There is um, a Transport for West Midlands freight strategy as part of the LTP and um, road to rail is, is one of the areas that we want to continue to, to explore. It does come back to 
it's not just about the capacity on, on the actual rail network. It then comes back down to have we got the right type of distribution facilities and setups to, to ensure that the freight gets to the end user. So there is a big focus on the first mile, last mile element around that and making sure we can do that in the most sustainable way. So whilst rail is part of the equation, it's the rest of the, the freight processes that need to align to make sure we get the most amount of benefit from that. Uh, so, the next question, Lydia's over there. The man wearing surprisingly little yellow. Uh. <laughs> Any other glasses? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yeah, my name's uh, Jez Collins from the Birmingham Music Archive. So, from that, you'll gather that I'm not a civil engineer. Um, kids would say I'm barely civil. Um, but it's, I'm really interested in uh, this, the idea of community engagement and, and how you've talked about it. So sorry to bring it back from freight to, to people and communities. Um, but uh, it's encouraging to hear what you've said. Um, but often, I think, James, you use the word integrity, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of assuming here, but I think perhaps a better word is authenticity. Uh, and there are often times when we, you know, organisations and institutions and big institutions talk to, to communities uh, and they just do feel left out and they don't understand the language. There's always an issue about language. But it would be remiss of me not to say that you know, the arts and culture sector, it's what we do. You know, we, we, we could take complex issues and present them and talk to people and communities in ways that they both engage with and can understand. So it's a little bit of a plea to say, how can you work better uh, with the arts and culture sector, but also, you know, I've you know had some issue, uh, had some projects with uh, you know uh, rail infrastructure, and I have to say it's fairly been fairly torturous. Uh, the people have been great, but when you're trying to deal with network rail, um, or when st uh, stations are no longer staffed, and you know you, you see suicides increasing in there, and you're trying to do something about it, it's really difficult to navigate your way into and, and, and know who to talk to, and the procurement is also uh, a nightmare. And we're often talking about little, relatively little sums of money in these massive big infrastructures. So it's, I suppose it's a double, double question. How can we work better together um, to, to work and solve some of the issues that you're facing? But how can the sector make it easier for us to work with you? Could I, could I come in just first? Because I think it, there's, a, there's an interesting thread here that, that's probably run through the entire discussion tonight that, that feeds into the, the, the comment that I made first, which is that we've got an opportunity here to get off on the right foot, even though we're part way through this project, so we can, we can start there. We can also look at the, uh, that authenticity piece, because I think a lot of what we've said this evening has been very much about how the, the needs of the communities are, that are affected by the, the project are very different, got very different profiles in terms of ethnic makeup, uh, socio-demographics, and a whole range of different factors. So there's a real opportunity to engage authentically and with integrity with communities up and down the route and by doing it in a tailored and, and bespoke way. And then I suppose, really specifically, we've got a project that is going to sit right in the centre of Birmingham's most kind of uh, culturally activated district in Digbeth. So the, there is an opportunity there to bring in meaningful engagement with um, Birmingham's thriving uh, art, food, and other, other, other communities based out of that part of the city to, to bring their perspectives, bring, bring, their, bring their take on all of this, and to start to design the kind of initiatives we want to build out with the project with, with their perspective built in from the start. Just a quick point. It's such an important one because it, it actually gets to that point of that ownership of what are very important assets to the transport work to communities. And just to give an example, we're currently building um, the Wensley Braley Metro Extension, so fundamentally transforming public transport access across the black country. Um, and there's really important bits of cultural heritage along that route. We've got Doric Parkhead Viaduct, which has been restored without sort of taking it away and putting something concrete back in place. And that's largely because of that really localised engagement and thinking, well, this is a really important part of the heritage here in the black country. There's Anson's Bridge, a really famous brewery in the black country. It's got a mural painted on it. So how, how we've been engaging the community around, we want to recreate that on the new structure that we've built to make it look and feel like it's owned by the community. So they, like you say, they, are, they may feel like small bits, but they mean a lot to the community. And they don't need a lot of funding. And I know we often talk about well, we've got to squeeze our project down, but they are very small elements in mega projects that can make a huge amount of difference. 
Anyone else to add anything? Just, I think it's, you know, the, there is an, 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 an ownership requirement on the department to step forward to build. I'm just going to yell because it's really annoying this microphone. Um, uh, on industry partners that, you know, step forward to deliver this project to demonstrate that they have the capability. Firstly, you're absolutely right. Just from the procurement point of view, to onboard uh, SMEs, CCSUs, you know, smaller, smaller providers onto their systems because you can't be spending days and days having to fill out endless amounts of paperwork just so that you can deliver a service and get paid. They have to demonstrate they've got that capability and they equally have to demonstrate that they've got the capability to engage with different partners to approach key stakeholders in their language and I go and this very much to me goes back to the trust piece. I mean we had a, uh, an example um, not that long ago with a, with a local school that, that uh, um, it was a school specifically for um, hearing impaired children and, it, and it's the ultimate example of how actually you can engage in different languages and you can communicate very complex subjects and, and get that, that buy-in from a really important stakeholder group that you want to be that diversity coming into your workforce. But you've got to work, funnily enough, with local providers, especially around arts and crafts, in putting your message into a form that's A, going to excite them, B, they're going to listen to you, and C, they're going to understand. But it's, the, it's up to the industry partners to demonstrate that capability with credibility. I, th I think that's a really great place to end because it kind of really humanises uh, what could be a very a faceless mega project. So I think a really good question to end on. Thank you. Uh, so thanks very much for everyone's uh, attention. Thanks for coming along. Please uh, join me in thanking the panel for their contributions tonight. And uh, yeah, the, uh, there's food and refreshments outside, so please enjoy. And thank you to Tim as well. Thank you. Thank you.